right? Yes. Okay. So, by 1852, there were the laws that stated that there had to be either integration of black and white children, or there had to be separation of black and white children. So Crawfordsville, Hamden, Hobbing, Pest and Fust and Disgust and wrote some very inappropriate newspaper articles and decided that it was time to separate. So in 1881, they built Lincoln Building One. And if you're familiar with the former Valentinos, and we all have a moment of silence and it's gone, um, they built that school right where Valentino's is now. It's kind of up the curve and up the hill. It was opened in 1882, had anywhere between 42 to 60 students, had four rooms initially and had a lovely playground. By the time the 19 teens rolled around, a lot of the Crawfordsville black population was moving to the East End because that's where the factories were. So Crawfordsville had yet another dilemma to deal with, and that was, okay, do we keep the school here, or do we move it out east to service those families that have moved out east? So by night, early 1920s, they decided that this was gonna become Horace Mann. For those of you who have been around long enough to remember it, this became Horace Mann. They, they renovated it quite a bit, made it a little bigger, made it a little nicer, and they moved Lincoln School out to the East End. Unfortunately, this building, which is long gone, they, they took this down in 1981, they, it wasn't ready by 1920, so they had to do something because Crawfordsville population was not about to allow integration. So they got some old corrugated tin, we believe from mid-states, and built a tin school at a corner right about here. Uh, and it was one room shack, it leaked. Most students didn't even bother to attend during the winter because, well, why? And so this then was opened around 1922. During the Depression, we just don't know a whole lot of what was happening because between the Depression and the Dust Bowl and then getting ready for World War II, this was kind of the last thing on people's minds. So when Vicki and I wrote the Underground Railroad book way back, it seems forever, in 2016, we knew we left a lot of stuff on the table. And one of the things we really wanted to focus on because people asked about it was Lincoln School. Uh, this is now being renovated. Um, the mayor was able to get some grants and some anonymous donors, and it is supposed to be done by the end of the summer. But of course, with, with barrel barreling through, they are running a little bit behind. There's been some materials issues, and so it's, uh, it's gonna be finished. It'll have pickleball courts, It'll have a lovely area for dedication explaining Lincoln School. So these are the two schools. By 1947, the law said you cannot segregate, you must integrate, and that's exactly what they did. We know of several stories where students would come out of Lincoln, which was the end of grade six, grade eight, and try to get into an integrated high school and things did not go well. We've talked about some of those stories, but what we're going to introduce to you tonight are a few of the alumni. And we're gonna introduce you to one of, well, all of these are my favorites, but Whitliff Smith, who is quite a character. Do you recognize the name Frances Wooden? Mm -hmm. As in Frances Wooden Park? Mm -hmm. She was a character too. Did anybody ever have the pleasure of meeting or interacting with her? Oh, let me show you. Blanche Patterson. I am on a mission, a mission to prove that she was the first black female uh, podiatrist in Indiana. Uh, unfortunately, well, we just haven't been able to prove that yet. We just have a lot of, of circumstantial evidence. Have you heard of Andy Robinson? As in the Andy Robinson gym. And then Wilbur and Sydney to Paris. Musician. 
Yes, indeed, they were jazz musicians. You can find their music on YouTube, it's still available. But we're going to introduce you to these five. There are others, including Vicki's dad. Um, and if get her to tell you the story of her father uh, by the end of today, um, Sam Churchill, have you heard of Sam? He was a bit of a stinker. Bank cigar, he was a <clears throat> pool hustler. <laughs> um, in, the ba in the back of the uh, bank cigar, he, apparently he honed his skills on Indiana Avenue in Indianapolis and came back and then, uh, um, um, but he hustled an awful lot of Wabash boys' money. Um, we'll just leave that there. All right. All right. First of all, let's start with Wycliffe. Trying to find Wycliffe was like trying to find a needle in the stack of needles. Because apparently, either they couldn't understand him when he spelled his name, or they just wrote down whatever they wanted to. So Wycliffe Smith has a bunch of different spellings. But what we do know is that he was born in Kentucky after the Civil War. 1868, 1869, we've got records that show both. How he ended up here, we haven't the faintest idea. But he shows up, and by 1888, prior to his high school graduation, he became the newly formed Republican Lincoln Club secretary. And if you go back into the Hoosier Chronicles, Nick, I giggled when you sent me that email. By the way, Nick is a star. He found teacher John Evans' obit in a smaller St. Louis newspaper. And I've got to forward that to you. I've already sent it to Evan and Nolan. So, yeah. Um, this particular group was a, a bunch of characters. We think it was integrated, but we aren't 100% sure. Remember, Crockersville is about half and half. And, but at any rate, they got into all kinds of debates. And Wycliffe was the king of debates. There's all kinds of newspaper articles where he and his partners or, or on his own won all kinds of different debates on something as simple as uh, would the cotton gin have changed the trajectory of the Civil War? Uh, there's a hot topic and a yeah. giant topic. So he, uh, he did that and then uh, they also got into a lot of the debates. Okay, now what do we do after the Civil War? It's been 20 years after the Civil War. What do we do? What have we gained? Are black students still being treated the same? So he was embroiled in one of the greatest dramas of Lincoln School One which is on Valentino's property. In 1890, there were 24 children in the grad children. I can say that because I'm old. But there were 24 graduates from Crawfordsville High School that year. 20 were female. Four were male. Of the four that were male, two were black. Wycliffe Smith and Henry Brown, Henry L. Brown. His dad was Henry A. Brown. And they were barbers and they were characters and we're just not gonna go down that road. Anyway, anyway, according to the newspapers, there was a big brouhaha. Two of the females, according to the newspaper, who were very staunch Republicans, were absolutely opposed to Wycliffe and Henry taking part in any graduation ceremonies. Not only were they opposed, they were adamant it wasn't going to happen. So the newspapers, being the newspapers, well, that's not fair, they graduated, they did everything they were supposed to. How dare you be so insensitive? Oh my goodness, we don't mix black and white in Crawfordsville, and it just went on and on and on. A very long story short, they all graduated together, Wycliffe and Henry had a part of the graduation ceremony and according to the newspapers at the time, acquitted themselves beautifully with their speaking. Whatever that means, you can read into it what you want. But they did not go to post-graduation parties together. As a matter of fact, two Civil War veterans, uh, Aaron McRae being one of them, 
held Henry's and Wycliffe's parties. And according to the newspapers, those parties were the place to be. <laughs> um, and you can probably just about guess they were dancing and singing and the food overflowed. And one of the newspapers even suggested that some of the white girls and definitely the two white boys actually went to their graduation parties. <laughs> Good for them. Because, hey, food, I'm there. So, anyway, a uh, very long story short, in August of 1890, right after he graduated, he goes to Illinois for a job at a cannon factory. That's all we know. We don't know what the name of it was. We don't know what he did. Obviously, since he was black, it was probably a janitor. He was on the line or something. By 1880s, or should be 1893, he'd come back to Crawfordsville and became involved with the Bethel a and Church. He became a trustee, he was in his mid-20s. By 1894, he is in the paper almost every week. He was winning all kinds of debates and he was beginning to be recognized nationally, which is really pretty cool. But his career was cut short in 1898 because the U.S. steamship Maine was sunk we can debate whether that was on purpose or not. And he enlists as part of the 161st Indiana Regiment. He served in Jacksonville, Florida, Savannah, Georgia, Havana, Cuba, and he was constantly writing his, uh, to his sister back here. And then those letters were published in the newspaper. He ended up with typhoid fever. He nearly starved because he was in black troops. He, they, they were the last to get food. Um, Wycliffe talks in great detail about the fact that you would go out at night and find whatever animal you could find, charbroil it and eat it because it was either that or starve. Um, he ended up coming back, had a great career here in Crawfordsville and he dies in October of 1932. Henry Brown, the other graduate, well, let's just say that he was a, uh, uh, he was a man about town <clears throat> and was run out of several hotels after being discovered with women married and uh, was actually run out of town and run to Chicago. So we'll skip it. <laughs> okay, Frances, you want her or you want me to do her? Frances Wooden. I would have given almost anything to have met this amazing, amazing woman. How many of you have been to Francis Wooden Park? Have you gone by Francis Wooden Park? Okay. There's a great story about her, what is now her park. At one time, it was the Northside Rec Center. It was just, it's got a great history, and we are so blessed that that was redone. In fact, Vicki, Miss Vicki, she was really adamant because Frances was stricken with polio and was handicapped. Yes. That we have equipment for handicapped children, mm -hmm. and there's also musical equipment. And she read my. She taught my mother today. Yes. She taught me. Which is why I look like this. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. Frances when she never married. Uh, she had one sister and two brothers. Is that correct? Yes. And one of the brothers actually died fairly early. Uh, one of the sisters stuck around town, Peggy, I believe. Peggy stuck around town. Um, and there are, I believe, some wooden descendants we were able to find that are still in town that are kind of uh, spread out of West yeah. Peggy. And, yes, but they're not yet where the, one of the sons, uh, the, the brother's uh, daughter lives. Okay, this is actually in the Amy Church there in Lafayette. In Lafayette. All right, so bless Frances's heart. She had quite a history. She was stricken with polio at age four. It damaged her right leg. Her foot actually turned over, so she walked on the top of her foot, not the bottom of the foot. Um, she walked with a crutch. She was very recognizable in town. There is actually a newspaper article that, if you remember Dr. Peralta, who was here until the 90s, I believe. Yeah. Um, he surgically repaired it with money from the Crawfords. The Crawfords, uh, yeah, it was a food store. I can't think of the, of the 
patriarch's name. It's not Forrest. Henry. Forrest. Forrest. Thank you, yes. Uh, but Forrest and his family actually paid for her to have it somewhat straightened. It still was never right, but at least it was better. And as far as we know, she was never in an iron lung, but that was what her, I guess I consider it lucky. It's not, but it, she's lucky it wasn't worse. So, when she was in third grade at Lincoln School, Dr. Robert Anthony, whose mother was the one who used smashed eels to cure shingles, went to Francis's mother, Fanny, I believe, and said, we want to move Francis up a grade. And Fanny says, I do not think so. <laughs> and Francis said, I don't think so either. Um, but they did it anyway. And so as it turned out, one of the teachers that we talked about last time, Clara Freese, her, her married name was Coleman, and Fanny, who was a, an amazing um, pianist, helped her catch up. This is my favorite quote from her. And this was from when they declared uh, 1987 Francis Wooden Day. I had a choice. I can sit around and feel sorry for myself, or I could just get out there with the rest of them and try. And try she did. She became a mother to so many children. So many children. My husband remembers. And he also remembers don't make Francis mad, as you would say. The brains is on the day. No, she didn't. And it didn't matter if you're white, she could pull a polka dot. She could catch you with, she catch you pulling by with the, either the cane or the crutch. <laughs> you forget totally what she was upset with you about with this milk. Uh, she made it clear what she, yeah. yeah. She, I, I really think no she was. No name calling, there was no nope. racism there. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the one safe place in the neighborhood where there was no, uh, she didn't do it. She didn't play that. Mm -hmm. So everybody was her kids, and she did, if anybody started calling names and they're not from the neighborhood, get out. Mm -hmm. She know. spent a lot of her own money on craft supplies mm -hmm. for the children who couldn't afford it otherwise. So she graduated from high school in 1935. She was part of the Sunshine Society. Uh, she was also quite the musician. Uh, she was hired to work on the Tuttle Elementary School okay. playground. Yeah, that takes us back, because that building was torn down in 1959 to build the new one, which some of us are way too familiar with, <laughs> and then that one didn't come down until 2014. But the catch was she had to learn to crochet, because part of her job was to teach the young girls to crochet and do handiwork so that they would be able to perform that when their families needed it. So at 19, she was hired, and she worked there for the next 30 five years and the kids obeyed her we've read so many accounts Frances was always very humble about it but the kids that she touched really were effusive in their praise Mary Glenn connect if you happen to remember him declared June 7th 1985 as Frances wooden day they had a huge ceremony for her at the North Side Rack, which was still there at the time. And uh, the, the Francis Wooden Park is named after her. She was quite a lady. She, I didn't get here until 1990, and she passed in 87, I believe. So I was never able to meet her. I wish I had. Uh, there are some great memories, and my husband won't tell me a couple of them because I know he got in trouble. <laughs> and if you know my husband, well, that kind of says a lot. Blanche Patterson. Blanche Patterson's grandmother was the one that founded the Bethel AM Church. This is her high school senior picture because the only other picture we had was from a newspaper, and it was, well, it was bad. 100 years old. It, it was, was over 100 years old sitting in a rocking chair. So, oh, that was Mariah, yeah. We didn't include her, but yeah, Blanche, well, well yeah, she was the one that uh, was a doctor. She was, they was well, a podiatrist, but they only had white patients. Yep. And she signed for the covenant community the best of the years. So the, the, the uh, coroner mm -hmm. wouldn't have to. That's what, in doing research, I, I noticed, you know, that she treats. 
that she did um, that she had. And then I said, yeah, that was one of the rules of to her office was in the in her building. And so even though she had an office in there, she still had to come in the back. And she could only treat white patients. And so, yes. And so I met while I was uh, at the Lane Place for Christmas of Memphis or something, an older lady walked up to me and said, I knew Blanche because she used to treat my mother. I'm like, wow. And she said she had the softest hands. And then we would go by the courthouse. I guess her father was a judge. And we see Sam. You know, talking about Sam Churchill, my the uncle who was the janitor at the courthouse, and at the time the janitor at the courthouse was also the mayor's man who would drive the mayor around. So they lived. There was an apartment upstairs, and on this family. So, but when she was a little girl, she called my uncle by his first name, and that. And that was common during that time to not give your own colored men and women this a salutation of Mr. or Mrs. And uh, that just struck me. You know, now others don't notice, but that's when I when uh, Wabash College had a picture of their cooks, all the white cooks and Mr. and Mrs and the covered coats had a nickname for the first name. And so, so. In fact, there was an Elizabeth Patterson, which we haven't quite figured out what the connection is yet. Yes, mm -hmm. we'll figure that out. Um, at any rate, this woman was amazing. There was nothing she couldn't do. She never married. She was an incredibly accomplished jazz pianist and singer and went on the road. What got me was she, when she taught classes in Lincoln, and she taught Lincoln. it was so many. It wasn't music. It was so many and domestic things, but not music was itself. You know, so that looking back, that's what struck me. Why was she? Because the violin they were under the auspices of the school system. It wasn't the colored school anymore. It was. I mean, as far as being run by the Indian Church, when it when the city took over, this that seemed to be a habit. Now she did graduate from Lincoln and then went back and taught part-time, along with owning a beauty shop and running it for white customers only in a white only building. And then she was also, again, she was a licensed podiatrist who just, we've got her diary. We just have it, we have it on the For the podiatry test. Yes. Under Dr. Anthony. Anthony, who was the principal at Lincoln. And then, so she was gonna start there. Colored Hospital, mm -hmm. Roosevelt Colored Hospital, yeah. which mm -hmm. Nick did an amazing article on, and I totally stole. Just <laughs> <laughs> and he knows, he knows. But because nobody, the neighborhood nobody knew, nobody knew, nobody knew about that. Yeah. Nick did. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> so by 1902, she graduates from Central High School, which is the predecessor to Crawfordville High School. She goes to Wilberforce University. Unfortunately, Wilberforce University had a huge fire and her records along with some of our other teachers are gone. They were literally burned up. So she joined a minstrel show as part of the Jubilee Gospel by back between 1911 and 1912. She was making $75.75 per year to teach children uh, music and the arts. 1926, she opens a beauty shop. She was active there until the 1960s. Unfortunately for us, this woman was 80. She got in her car in February. It was a nasty February. She was going to Jasper to do what Blanche did, and then she was going to care for some friends, and a car skidded in the ice and crushed her, and she died. Um, there is some question um, as to the care she received. Culver had to accept her. And I, well, and I know Culver was active at that point because I was born three months later. Um, so, but I, we don't know exactly how all that transpired. It was in a, 
because the accident happened in a white county, Jasper, an area that she had to be brought back here. So we, we could they have saved her? Probably not. Reading her um, death certificate, there just there were so many internal injuries. There were, and she was eighty at the time, so we don't think they could have, they could have helped her. But what I find fascinating is Blanche being Blanche. All her money was left to support a home for the elderly in Indianapolis, a black home for elderly. Uh, she knew. She knew that things were just not fair. All right. Next on our list is Andrew Robinson. You got this one? I know why you're doing this, because you're related to his wife. No, him. Oh, I thought that was his wife. No, his just just tell him. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna sit for this one. How much time do we have? Uh you got about five minutes because we got one more. Okay. okay. Well, I'm just gonna tell you what happened. While my cousin Edward came to town to speak on uh, Eddie Burnett to speak at the Juneteenth celebration to tell what it was like because he he was in my class, 73, and we went to school across the schools when they were still, there's still segregation was legal in Indiana. And then in 63, when it stopped, then it changed, but not a lot, you know, going to school. And so he related some things that happened to the family, like uh, his, his father and my grandmother were brother and sister. We always thought there were only four sisters. There were six sisters. Two of the older ones, none of us ever people knew anything about. I found out that one of the older sisters was Andy Robinson's mother. All this time, my mother didn't say anything. But he was her cousin, you know, that that was close to relation. It blew my mind. I'm like, what else, you know, of all the stuff I learned, while doing the research, some of it made me cry. A lot of it made me mad. But in order to channel my anger, I said, to get the stories out and lift them out. So that's why we wrote the book. And that's why it's only $20 so everybody can afford it to find out this is part of my story. Because there's over a, maybe 100 names. We have no idea the family history, what, where they lived, anything going on. So in case somebody's looking, we will make sure that information is out there. Because I discovered that my, my uh, great-grandfather died chasing racists who were chasing my, my uncle, my great-uncle. He was 12. They, they were teasing him to raise his comments, so he chased them, and then he died of a heart attack on the porch. Imagine being my great uncle, being 12, and your dad's dead. What? And to be able to, we have to go on. So, you know, getting the story out there, and even though I had a cousin that died because the hospital wouldn't take cover. Not the hospital, the ambulance wouldn't take her. So at two and a half, he died when they tried to take him to the hospital. But good news is, my sister worked for the State Department, got my mother to go to Obama, one of Obama's in my little house. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we are making progress. And we just want to make next year, because we are going to do this. Okay, because there's more stories to be told. And I hope you all enjoy it. Thank you. Andy Robinson. Okay. Love, 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 love. Yes. Andy Robinson. Yeah, his stories in the book. Yep. Grew up during the Depression. His dad went out to work with his parents, were very loving. They took care of him. The man was a sports god. I have no other way to describe him. Mayor Barton actually played ping pong against him or bowled against him. Was it ping pong? Ping pong. Mm -hmm. Mayor Barton got his butt kicked just asking about it. When we did the podcast 
for uh, Juneteenth. Mayor Barton admitted that online, so it's on, we have it. He um, eventually goes to work for the Coney Island Restaurant, which is near where Rosalind Baker used to be, the courthouse parking lot. Um, he was a short order cook. He never graduated from high school. He felt that going to World War II was far more important. He was in the quartermaster, served all over the world, and came back to Carthville to realize World War II may be over. He may have served, but things had not changed. He worked at Montgomery Wards. He worked at Ray Bestis. He won awards. And then Ellen Ball, who used to be on the Carthville School Board, there, Kathy Steele was our superintendent at the time, and the old Boys and Girls Club, which we now call the AR Gym, it's on Chestnut Street, they uh, what they decided that they were gonna name the front for a former superintendent, because that was gonna be offices, but the back they were gonna keep a gym, and they wanted to name it after Andy. <laughs> so the story goes, and this came from Ellen, Ellen said, yeah, she said I got all dressed up and I had big old speech, right, because you know Ellen, I mean, she is, she is a perfectionist. She knocks on the door. Mr. Robinson, may I talk to you for a minute? Sure. Come on. So he sits down and Ellen goes through about half her speech and she gets, she said, we'd really like to name the gym at the back of the old boys and girls club after you. Okay, I think that'd be fine. <laughs> that was his response. <laughs> and so when he goes, when they do the dedication, Andy was there and Andy just said, thank you for this honor, and gets away from the microphone. That's it. He was that humble of a man. He wasn't, but he was so humble. But he was vicious, ping pong, bowling, <laughs> rollers. He was the man at all the time. Because the uh, skating rink was uh, segregated. Mm -hmm. And then there was an accident with the bunch of the black kids going to a dead villa of Lord. And so they decided to stop, stop uh, being segregated because Monday night was colors by color night and stuff. So who wants to go to school? Right? Who wants to go to school? But anyway, um, yeah. So the, he helped bridge, be the bridge by teaching, you know, doing the dance, skating classes, and that kind of thing. And so black and white, he didn't care. And so that was his thing. He was a bridge. In fact, he was on my dad's bowling team, the first black uh, bowling team that had no sponsors, but they called themselves Black Lightning. It was Andy, my dad, and um, Jared Dornell, and my uncle Ted. And they kicked butt. <laughs> because even though they weren't allowed to bowl, in the, you know, they were pin guys, and so on Friday nights. Pin boys got the bowl for free, so that's where they honed their skills, just bowling at night. And, and so nobody expected them to be able to bowl. But they had no problem with sponsors after that. Mm -hmm. You know, whatnot. Oh. And they kind of broke up the team a little bit. They let them go on other teams. Just have a yes. And Andy's wife broke Jasmine Robinson, broke serious barriers at Wabash College. Yes. The woman was a legend. She, she basically, you didn't mess with Jasmine. If Jasmine thought it needed to be done this way, they learned very quickly that was the way to do it, not to mention the woman can cook. Could cook, she's passed now. Uh, but there's a cookbook called Cooking with Jazz. I have a copy, and I'm not sharing. I'll make you a copy, but I'm not giving it to you. I love you. Okay, last and certainly not least, Wilbur and Sydney to Paris were indeed jazz musicians. I think, I think there was an article in the Star maybe 50 years ago. Yes, we have it. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, sadly, they didn't get a whole lot of the recognition they deserved when they were alive, but Wilbur and Sydney to Paris had a wonderful upbringing. They both graduated from Lincoln One, which was over on Valentino's. Uh, Dad was a jack of all trades to support the family. The beauty of it is he was a uh, he was a disciplinarian. So the story goes that one night Wilbur runs away to uh, a local carnival and hears somebody playing the saxophone. Now there's some argument as to what kind of saxophone it is. I don't care. The point is the kid ran away. He was fascinated with the music. Daddy finds out, beats the holy crap out of him and says, okay, 
You want to learn how to play a musical instrument? Let's go. So the entire family were musicians. Mm -hmm. So Wilbur and Sydney and Sydney's birthday, we they're all over the place. They graduated from Lincoln School for Colored Children on uh, Friday, the something June 4th, 1915, which was held at Bethel. All the grad Lincoln School graduations were held at Bethel. Mm -hmm. While in high school, Wilbur had a serious case of basketball itis. <laughs> Couldn't play a lick, but he he enjoyed. I, I think he just enjoyed probably the movement and the mm -hmm. sounds. But he was in the band, and Frances Wooden, who you've met, um, was able with <coughs> Frances and her mother were, went up to the Woodsman of America Hall at 120 North Green Street. If you know where Jarocho is. The, the market and uh, used to be the Montgomery County out of school suspension. Mm -hmm. There's that giant three story brick building. The top floor is boarded up and they tell me I can't get in there, but what if they don't, they don't won't hurt them. <laughs> <laughs> By 1919, we pick up Wilbur in Philadelphia. He's at the Pearl Theater. He always plays back home in Indiana during his shows. And he was supposed to be there for two weeks. It turned in to like 10 years until they finally had to close the place. These two gentlemen played with the likes of Jelly Roll Morton, Louis Armstrong, Ella Fitzgerald. Um, these were the people of jazz. Wilbur eventually creates a group called the New New Orleans Jazz Band with his brother Sidney. You can find their music on YouTube. You can order it off Amazon. At the library, too. At the library, yeah. And they've got a special thing over at Carnegie mm -hmm. on the De Paris Brothers. Wilbur, in 1958, got a call from the president and said, hey, I need you to go to Africa for three months to be the official United States ambassador, ambassador of music to Ghana in Africa. And Wilbur said, okay. <laughs> and off he went. And he was nothing but perfect for the job comes back. By this point, his brother Sidney is starting to become ill, so Wilbur took care of Sidney. Wilbur, we think, at one point married and had four kids, but there's a whole lot of hot mess in there somewhere we haven't figured out. Yeah, what name? Yeah, and because it was in Paris, D. Paris, even that's spelled differently. So we think, but we don't know what happened to his wife, we don't have his kids. So anyway, Sidney dies, then Wilbur dies, and now they're famous. So I would like next year for us to uplift their story and maybe do something oh, else yeah. to uh, we'll teach y'all to dance. Since we like you, uh, yes, <laughs> the, the black part should be interesting. Uh -huh. Anyway, that's one of the dances that I do. <laughs> oh. uh, but uh, I'd like to lift, you know maybe have a jazz band play some of their numbers, their numbers because they had albums out and like I said, jazz ambassadors were you know because they driven and but the shame was when they came home mm -hmm. they could they couldn't stay in the hotel oh, have you seen the movie green book yes watch the movie if you haven't and that was like the it was, it's called the green, green book that a list of as a list of places where that allow that people to stay in the north because in the south they know they know where they're because it's time to say in the north, it was hard to tell, and so it was the mailman who gave, who would give the information to the publisher of the Green Book and say, "This is where you can stay without being hassled. This has this hotel. You're welcome to come in in northern Indiana. Have this Green Book several several times. Carpersville had Carpersville had a Green Book. Yes, um, Sam Churchill, who we talked about, was a semi-pro baseball player. We can't prove that he played for the Black League, the Negro Leagues, but he's very clear in his reminiscences when he was playing baseball, they knew where the team could stop and eat, and they knew where they couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, and my dad played ball, ball, too, and I met one of his little ball players and uh, who played with him, and he said, you know, if we went to a place to eat and they wouldn't let Grant eat there, we didn't eat there either. So I said thank you, thank you for that and stuff. But this man was like, you know, older. And he did that for you know in his early twenties, and and uh, he still remembered that incident. It's amazing what they remember. And 
and how vivid it is. Yes. All right. So, darling Deli, we are done. Do you have any questions? I have one question. When yes. is your marker going to go up? May. That was in my list. May. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I had no <laughs> Well, fine. <laughs> well, I've had quite a few people ask. Yes, stuff on fingerprints on it. I can read around those. Yes. Uh, we've, hopefully, by the next, uh, in the spring, we will be unveiling the historical marker at the Lincoln Park. And Jerry Norvell, the oldest of living alumni, has agreed to pull them to unveil it. He's 95 years old. He, during the last day of Juneteenth, we had a celebrate the uh, Jubilee celebration at Bethel, and he spoke quite clearly about being, you know, a, a alumni from Lincoln and the first black businessman who still lived, who still the business is still going, and his daughter Denise Elmore is running it now, and she's my aunt. I'm letting everybody. I'm finding out. You know? Mm -hmm. So, yes. I found out where my grandfather's first name was. He was under an alias because he was able from the service. So, Grandpa Fred was Grandpa Fred. He was Grandpa Murray. Oh, okay. Mom's gone. Can't explain. So, that's one mystery for me. <laughs> so, yeah. It was, it's been a journey. And it's just started. The more questions you have, the more yes. we create. And oh, yeah. people finding us, because my great great grandma, whose mother had remarried, I found a cousin who saw the story on Lincoln, on Friends of Lincoln Park. She contacted Delhi, and to find out, we sent her cousin. Because oh, yeah. she was coming from that, and named names all of a sudden, bam, there it was, the connection. So, I don't know, I might be related with y'all. <laughs> <laughs> They've already asked us if we are, but we're like, we can't be because we married Hudson's. Oh. So we would have to be married. Well, anyway. So, yes, the marker will, well, they were going to try to put it up in September, and I'm thinking the first dump truck that hits my marker, I'm going to hurt somebody. <laughs> so we decided that we are going to move it until May. Hopefully, it'll be done. Plus, it's kind of appropriate because May is when you end school, and that was when Building Friendly closed in 1947. Yes. So we've got the post. The po oh, where the marker is, but the post is here. So whatever it shows up, we'll stick it up and go. Yes, so. Exactly. Yeah. So yes, it's so I think Sam in the book is was supposed to be financing the marker, but we. I Shannon, would agree. But Shannon couldn't wait, so she wrote a grant, so the money's going toward uh, double. Yes. I, I don't you, you don't you don't make any money. It either goes to the Carnegie, it goes to Lou Wallace, or it goes to Bethel. Yes. Because yeah. I can't write well enough to do that. Yes, sir. Okay, Terry and Lisa want to say something. Oh. I think
saying. I remember these from my pet fancy days. From my good eyes. Because we have always loved brass packs, very nice collection. And um, anyway, the top collection. Even better than chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> you look in page 160. Yes. That's the only good thing for. It is. That's one from Bill of Churchill. Uh -huh. The one with the little girl. See it. That is Carol's sample. Carol Rankin's sample. Right there. Oh. In school. Oh my God. There's a better picture. I couldn't find a, a good picture just in front. Yeah, because all the other pictures it oh takes them. We'll see at the side so. so that the bottom part of the doors are oh hidden. Oh my. But you can God. see them in the one with the little girl. Sort of. You can't tell what it says, but you can see oh, it. Oh, I know what I remember. Yeah. What that's the real condition. Oh my goodness. Where'd you find Thank this again? Thank you. Now, where did you that find it? I'm an auction probably 40 years ago. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh, my oh wow. So you can oh, open up to be the Oh my gosh. So anyway, Shannon, I remember, but I didn't forget. Oh, no. Thank you. I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. Well, I was going to give you one for Christmas. Oh, that's okay. You can make some rhymes. Okay, you got it? No, I'm not going to cry. I'm going to get Eric is up there behind oh. him. Behind him. Well, I'm going to get two suits. Oh, okay. I'm going to get two suits. I'm going to get two suits. I'm going to get two suits. What are the odds? Oh, my okay. face in the way. Shannon? I'm working on it. I'm trying to keep it even. Okay. Okay, fast before I move. Too late. Now we can't be. There you go. Oh, oh my gosh. Gosh. Sure. I'm going to get a picture here. Here. Put Shannon over on the camera. Actually, they're not really like that. These are even better than the stolen bricks. I mean, bricks that we found on the side. <laughs> um, yeah. I stole them. <laughs> From this school? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good for you. You scrambled up like a thief in the night. <laughs> you can't miss this thief, and it was during the day, and I really didn't care if anybody said anything. I wanted oh. bricks. Thank you so much. Can we get a magnet? Oh, yeah. And so you remember this. What are the odds? I know. I bet she would be the next one on her. Okay, I don't believe you guys have any of this is. She has yet to cook for me. <gasps> I know. I wouldn't put them outside. No. 